really excited about our program today, but before introducing our speaker, uh, a few housekeeping uh, matters. First, um, if you're requesting CME credits, please see our event post on our website, oshercenter.org, um, and you'll find clear and simple instructions for completing this process via email. And second, a little bit of information about the structure of this virtual event today. During the seminar, you'll be able to hear our speaker and um, see her slides and see her as well. And if during the course of, of the seminar, you have questions that you'd like to ask of the speaker, please use the question and answer feature at the bottom right side of your Zoom screen. Um, my team and I will collate your questions and then share them with the speaker um, at the end of her presentation and we're saving some time for some question and answer. So now it's my distinct pleasure um, to introduce our distinguished uh, presenter today, who's also a colleague and a good friend, Dr. Christine Gertz. Dr. Gertz is a true pioneer and leader in pragmatic and health sciences research related to musculoskeletal health. She's currently a professor in musculoskeletal health uh, research at uh, Duke Clinical Research Institute and the director of system development and coordination for spine health in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Duke University. She's also the chief executive officer of the Spine Institute for Quality, also known as Spine IQ. And prior to this role, she had a long stretch serving as the vice chancellor of research and health policy at Palmer College of Chiropractic, who the OSHA Center has a longstanding collaboration with. Dr. Gertz received her Doctor of Chiropractic degree from Northwestern Health Sciences University and her PhD in Health Services Research, Policy and Administration uh, from the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. Her 30-year research career is focused on working with multidisciplinary teams to design and implement clinical and health services research um, that are designed to increase knowledge uh, regarding the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of uh, patient-centered non-pharmacological treatments for the spine. Dr. Gertz has served as principal investigator on a number of large-scale and highly impactful uh, federal grants, and she's co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers. Her leadership has resulted in her serving on a number of high-level national committees, including CDC's Opioid Work Group, and since 2019, I believe, she served as the chairperson for PCORI, or the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute on the Board of Governors, that is. For these and many reasons, um, I'm really excited that she can be part of our grand rounds. The title of Dr. Gertz's presentation today is Non-Pharmacological Approaches to Pain Management, Lessons Learned from Pragmatic Trials of Chiropractic for Low Back Pain. So without further delay, and I'm sure if we were in an audience, you'd hear a lot of clapping and applause, I'd pass the platform on to you. Thank you so much, Peter. It's, I really appreciate the the invitation to, to speak this morning and looking forward to, um, to having some, um, some questions and interaction with, with, the, um, with all of you um, at, the, at the end of the talk. So Peter already um, indicated the, um, the, the name of, of the talk, just my, um, my list of, hmm, some reason. There we go. My list of disclosures, um, for the most part, Peter has already um, indicated to you. Um, just the only thing I'd also bring to your attention is that I'm an adjunct professor in the Department of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health and that I'm vice chairperson of the research committee of the World Federation of, of Chiropractic. Good. Christine, I, I cannot see your slides yet. Oh, Have you're you, kidding. We shared them. I, let me just go back. All right, let's try this again. Yes, there we go. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Okay. All right, I won't read you my disclosures again. But what I would like to do is I would like to, to start out by um, dedicating this, this talk to, to my father, Dan Horn. He, um, we lost him one year ago today, and um, he would have been very excited to, um, to know that I was, I was um, speaking to, um, speaking at, at a, giving a lecture at Harvard. And so dad, this, um, 
this talk is dedicated to you. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why, um, why the, my focus today is on, is on low back pain. What, you know, what are the reasons for um, why this is such an important public health issue? Low back pain is the number one cause of global disability currently with an 80%, up to 80% lifetime prevalence in adults. If you haven't had a chance yet to, to take a look at the, the 2018 Lancet series on low back pain, I would really invite you to do so. It's just a, a great overview of, of what we know about low back pain, what we know about treatments and um, recommended next steps from, from a, really from a global perspective. And um, the estimated total healthcare costs for low back pain and neck pain combined are estimated at $134 billion annu annually in the United States. With, and commonly used treatments are um, often result in th that cost. Um, perhaps we could deal better with, uh, with the, the high prevalence of low back pain and with that very high cost, but commonly used medical treatments often result in unacceptable levels of harm and are, are not effective. And just going to give you an example of opioids. The prescription opioid involved overdoses were more than four times higher in 2018 than in, 2000, than in 1999. And even though that we're starting to see a, a slow decrease in um, in the amount of the number of opioid de related deaths, it is the number is still very, very high. The estimated opioid related costs from, from um, 2015 to 2018 are estimated at $2.5 trillion by, by the White House when they include um, both health care, lost productivity, the impact on the criminal justice system, and the value of a statistical life. And, Sales of prescription opioids quadrupled from 1999 to 2014, but there's not an overall change in the amount of pain uh, that Americans reported. And um, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Aaron Krebs, um, conducted a, a study that was published a couple of years ago looking at the effect of opioids versus non-opioid medications and pain-related function in patients with chronic low back pain or hip and knee osteoarthritis, the, the SPACE trial. What she found is that treatment with opioids was not superior to treatment with non-opioid medications for re improving pain-related function over 12 months. And the authors concluded that the results do not support the initiation of opioid therapy for moderate to severe chronic back pain. So that given the, the high incidence of, of low back pain and given the fact, and I, I, I'm sort of, um, I chose to, to talk about opioids, but the truth is that there is, there's actually very little in the conventional um, medical toolbox for, for back pain that, that currently is shown on average to, to result in more, um, more good than, than harm. Um, we, we're getting um, increasingly learning more about, about NSAIDs and not only with gastrointestinal disorders, but they're now linked to a, um, a high, even short-term um, short use of higher doses of, of NSAIDs are linked with um, an increased risk of acute myocardial infarction. And, and people with, with very common um, um, comorbidities such as, as diabetes, um, et cetera, are, are, are also showing poor outcomes associated with, with the use of, of NSAIDs. There are, uh, you know, early, early surgical interventions and corticosteroid injections have been shown to, um, to not lead to, to a high level of benefit, um, especially in, in the long run. Often there, there are risks associated with those procedures and <clears throat> at, at one year the outcomes are, are often very similar um, between people who, who had those procedures and, and people who did not. So as we're moving, as, as we're starting to think about how to, how to approach the, the um, 
the epidemic of, of low back pain and, and, the, and the growing realization that some of these treatments are, are not as effective as we would like them to be, people are starting to, to think increasingly about alternatives. And, and one of those alternatives is, is chiropractic. So there are now a number of guidelines which are focusing on non-pharmacological non approaches for, um, for back pain. The one I'm gonna focus on today is the American College of Physician Guideline for Low Back Pain. The, this was published in Annals of Internal Medicine in 2017. And just a quick summary of the recommendation was that physicians and patients should treat acute, subacute, and chronic low back pain with non-drug therapies. And the, the guideline in particular um, talks about acute and subacute um, low back pain, recommending superficial heat, massage, acupuncture, and spinal manipulation. For chronic low back pain, they recommend exercise, including Tai Chi and yoga, spinal manipulation, and progressive relaxation. And the interesting thing about the ACP guideline is that um, in this guideline, that their recommendation is that these, these non-pharmacological approaches should be considered first. And it's only when back pain doesn't respond to non-drug therapies that we should consider NSAIDs, um, tramadol or duloxetine, and with opioids as a, as a very last resort. And as one of the things that these, um, these guidelines have um, in, in common between, this guideline has in common between um, subacute, um, acute, and chronic low back pain is that they recommend spinal manipulation for, um, for all three. So spinal manipulation is a technique where practitioners use their hands or device, but mostly their hands, to apply a controlled thrust. That is the force of a specific magnitude or degree in a specific direction to a joint in your spine. One of the most common complementary health approaches in the United States is spinal manipulation, and it's most commonly administered by doctors of chiropractic. If, there's, if you'd like to know more about spinal manipulation, nccih.nih.gov has a great website, actually, not, not on, on a variety of non-pharmacological approaches that is, is um, appropriate for both um, clinicians and for patients. So doctors of chiropractic define themselves as the primary care professionals for spinal health and well-being. They're regulated by healthcare licensing boards in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and multiple U.S. territories. There's an estimated 77,000 DCs in the United States and about 103,000 worldwide. About 64% of chiropractors are in solo clinical practice, um, with, and about 15% practice in multidisciplinary practices, including the Veterans Health Administration, the Department of Defense, and Defense, and um, actually in the Osher Center at Harvard as well. The primary clinical focus of doctors of chiropractic is muscular skeletal disorders with low back pain as the most common treatment or the most common conditions seen by doctors of chiropractic. In addition to the spinal manipulation that we've already mentioned, treatment approaches can include other manual therapies um, such as myofascial release, um, physiotherapeutic modalities such as um, ultrasound and um, hot and, and cold, exercise and instruction, rehabilitation, nutritional advice, and about 15% of chiropractors also practice acupuncture. Doctors of chiropractic are covered um, by the majority of payers, including Medicare and Medicaid, the VA and the Department of Defense. However, that, um, that there are often um, restrictions or, or limitations to, to payment that, that can create barriers to um, to reimbursement for, for chiropractic. I don't really have time to go into that um, today, but would be glad to talk about that off, offline at some point. So what I'm gonna talk about today, there, there's been a lot of research conducted on in chiropractic, some of it um, at, the, at the Osher Center um, through, through our um, the Palmer collaboration and, and otherwise, but I'm, I'm going to, um, talk today about the research I know best, which is the research that I've truly had the, have the, had the privilege to, um, to be involved with over the last um, 15 years or so. 
And I'm going to start off talking about a little bit about model development. So one of the questions that I hear real, really frequently when in talking to chiropractic about audiences that are not as familiar with chiropractic practice is how do we incorporate, um, how in fact do we incorporate um, chiropractic care within multidisciplinary models? And so I've worked with a, a number of um, of researchers over the last and clinicians over the the last several years really looking at that question and we had an opportunity to to participate in a, a multidisciplinary um, effort in um, in Davenport Iowa with a, a primary care clinic there and some scientists at the University of Iowa and um, and Thomas Jefferson University looking at um, interdisciplinary practice models for older adults with back pain um, to and, and developing a collaborative care model that for for what it what it might look like for primary care physicians and, and chiropractic physicians to to work together in, in caring for um, caring for patients. Um, in this case, our this was a model where where the clinicians were not co-located. So um, so they so they were um, in in different clinics, but but attempting to coordinate care through um, a shared care treatment plan, um, updating um, you know, clinician updates using telephone consultations. You can you can tell that this is a the study is a little bit dated because um, uh, other than um, I think now we'd be using uh, hopefully using a mutual um, EMR rather than um, status update date letters, but. And, and an important component of this um, of this effort was really to was interprofessional education. And what we we learned is that there were really important gaps in what what doctors of chiropractic understood about medical practice and what um, what um, medical doctors understood about chiropractic practice. And and by um, by through a series of lunch and learns and the opportunity for clinicians to to shadow um, the, the other profession they really learned a, a great deal about um, about each other and what was um, and 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 how they approach patient care which then helped in in, in when when a, a if a clinician was making a, a medical physician was making a, a recommendation for chiropractic care having a much better understanding of what that in, entailed and um, and we also are looking at research record sharing um, how, how do we make sure that we're able to um, gather data from from patients and in um, using using web using a, a web um, primarily rather than paper records. So that, that model development led to a, a small um, pilot randomized control trial um, looking at testing out that professional um, multidisciplinary model. And what we found was that um, all the, what we compared was um, medical care alone, medical care plus um, chiropractic, but where the, the clinicians were, were um, talking to each other um, on a regular basis about the patient care and, and, um, and also a, a parallel play model where the doctors of chiropractic and um, medical physicians were both treating the patients, but not, um, but not interacting as, as much with the patients. And what we learned is that all three of those models led to modest improvements in low back pain intensity and disability for, for older adults. But, we, but those models that included chiropractic were um, the patients um, perceived um, a higher level of improvement and their patient, um, their patient satisfaction was higher than with the primary care model alone. And, and what, what we learned is that um, a lot of times when you're doing this research, you, you learn things at the very end that you wish you'd known at the beginning. And this was one of those that, that um, it was interesting that patients, they, they did not perceive any difference between um, the models where the, the physicians and, and doctors of chiropractic were interacting with each other and those, um, and the model where they were not because they were aware that that there was a connection which was really important to them but um that seemed to matter more to them than knowing that they were in or just knowing that they were they're both caring for them and that they knew about each other was more important than the fact that they are as, as important as knowing that they were interacting together on a regular basis 
The, the next model that I'd like to talk, talk about briefly is the primary spine practitioner model that a number of colleagues and, and I um, wrote about in 2017. And we proposed a primary spine um, practitioner workforce that um, includes advanced level clinicians with advanced or doctoral level training in the treatment of spine related disorders that have demonstrated success in evidence based patient centered conservative treatment strategies for um, for spine and that would be able to operate either within a patient-centered medical home or an accountable care organization, either independently um, as, as we talked about in the previous model um, or as a virtual member of such organizations. And, and the examples of primary spine practitioners that, that, we, um, that we focused on were doctors of chiropractic and doctors of physical therapy. And I want to um, switch gears a little bit and talk about some um, what we've learned from looking at um, at healthcare um, databases, healthcare delivery databases. So, the first study I want to I want to emphasize is is a study that I had an opportunity to participate in with my um, with my led by my colleague at the the VA, um, Dr. Anthony Lisi, and and many of his his colleagues looking at opioid use among veterans of recent wars um, receiving Veterans Affairs chiropractic care. And we, we identified about 14,000 um, veterans with at least one chiropractic visit. And of those, uh, just over 4,000 also received one or more opioid prescriptions. And what we learned that, that the percentage of veterans receiving opioid prescriptions was lower in each of the 30-day um, timeframes assessed after the index chiropractic visit than, um, than before. Now this this obviously this is a um, this is a, a database analysis. There are, there are always a lot of issues related to studies where you're trying to do secondary analysis using using claims data. I won't go into the limitations and weaknesses, but what we're starting what we're looking for is really you know are there patterns that there that doctors that use of chiropractic might lead to a decrease in the use of opioids and. We um, had an opportunity to, um, to conduct an, another study looking at a cross-sectional analysis of per capita supply of doctors of chiropractic and opioid use in younger Medicare beneficiaries. And what we found is that in those areas where there are higher numbers of doctors of chiropractic and, um, and um, spending on CMT, there was an inverse correlation with the percentage of younger beneficiaries who had at least one, um, as well as six or more opioid prescriptions. However, if they did have a, an opioid prescription, um, their um, the use or the supply of chiropractic and spending on CMT was not correlated. Meaning, it may have there may there was a correlation between whether the person had an opioid prescription or not, but if they had a, an opioid prescription, it did not impact how much, um, how, how, how many morphine equivalents that opioid user um, was taking. The, the, an, another issue that I'd like to talk about really briefly is, is cost and, and what are the, the Often when, when talking to, to payers and employers about the inclusion of, of chiropractic care, one concern is that, the, that, that this is a, a cost add-on. And, and yet there's, there's some research to indicate that, that chiropractic may actually be a, a substitute for, um, for um, other chiropractic care. In, in this study, um, my colleague at, um, at Dartmouth, um, Dr. Brooke Martin, as, as well as um, a number of scientists at the University of, of Kansas City, looked at the association of complementary and alternative medicine use and, and healthcare expenditures for back and neck problems. And we, we had an opportunity to look at over 12,000 um, um, medical expenditure panel um, survey respondents with low back pain and neck pain. And what we what we found is that for those people, and, and I'm using um, Doctor of Chiropractic here, even though the, the title of the original article talked about complementary and integrative health in general because those terms are really um, interchangeable. What we, we looked at all um, complementary and integrative health use and then um, chiropractic and what we found out is that 
that they were approximately the same, primarily because doctor, chiropractic was the primary um, driver, the vast majority of complementary and integrative health in that database was, um, was, was in fact chiropractic. But what we found was that adjusted annual medical costs among chiropractic users was about $424 um, lower for spine-related costs than when compared to non-chiropractic users. And we also had an opportunity to be involved with, with a, another study um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield in, in Tennessee. And what we, we looked at here was, um, were there different, was there a differential in, in overall costs for, for patients who, um, who, who saw a chiropractor first versus a medical doctor or a doctor of, of osteopathy? And what we found is that the lower overall episode cost of care with low back pain um, um, initiated with a DC was between 20 and 40 percent lower than, than care initiated by either an MD or a, or a DO. Again, there's, there's a lot more work that, that needs to be done in, in, in these particular areas, but there, there is um, a growing cadre of evidence that's starting to point us in the, this direction and, and certainly illustrates the, the need to, to look at some of these questions more closely in, in the context of even larger database studies and randomized clinical trials. Um, uh, Peter mentioned um, in in the introduction that I've that I've um, that I've had a focus on pragmatic clinical trials. I actually started er early on looking at chiropractic, looking at more um, lo trying to look at more mechanistic studies and and more efficacy studies. And but over time, really starting to feel that that that. That while while these are incredibly important questions, and they are incredibly important questions, and I'm glad there there are a lot of scientists who are still focused on those. That but for me personally, my my interest is really in I'm a really a, a, where the rubber meets the road kind of scientist, and I'm I'm interested in what's happening in real world situations. What are the what kind of care are patients receiving, and and what are what um, what are the outcomes of of that care, and and that, which is let, what led me down the, the path towards more pragmatic clinical trials. Also, um, there, there's increasing interest on the part of funders, including the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, but, but also um, the Department of Defense and um, PCORI and, and others in, in, um, in supporting this kind of work. So I'm going to spend just a little while now sharing, um, sharing the design and results of, of a study that we had published in, in JAMA Network Open a couple of years ago, looking at the effect of usual medical care plus chiropractic care versus usual medical care alone on pain and disability among U.S. service members with low back pain. And this is our, our, um, our study flow. Basically, we, um, we conducted a, um, a baseline visit and then we, we allocated 750 patients to receive either usual medical care alone or um, usual medical care plus chiropractic. And then we conducted um, web-based assessments at week two, week four, week six, and week 12. Our outcomes, our primary outcomes were um, uh, um, a pain intensity using a numerical rating scale and physical functioning using the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. Our secondary outcomes were responder analysis, those who used it showed at least a 30% improvement, satisfaction, and um, perceived improvement. Our study sites were um, Walter Reed um, um, Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, where um, chiropractic care is delivered in the Department of Orthopedics, Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. There are two DC providers, at least at that time, and they've had chiropractic care at that clinic since 1998. The next was the Naval Hospital in Pensacola, Florida. Their chiropractic care is provided in sports medicine and a rehabilitative um, therapy clinic. They have a single um, chiropractic provider there and, and chiropractic care was established in 2003. And then the, um, the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, in San Diego, California, where chiropractic care is provided as a special service of physical therapy and a, um, a single DC provider. And again, care established in um, 2003. Our eligibility criteria for this study were um, 
uh, active duty um, military at that particular MTF, age 18 to 50, who um, were experiencing acute, subacute, or chronic low back pain. We excluded those that had low back pain from a non musculoskeletal source who had contraindications for lumbar um, spinal manipulation, had used spinal manipulation within the last month, had PTSD, and um, were not able to commit to following our, our study protocols. So we used um, our group assignment by allocation with minimization to balance groups on sex, age, chronicity, and the worst low back pain intensity in the past 24 hours. Our statistical methods for our primary outcomes, we used um, linear mixed effects models over all time points with site, site by group, and time by group, and site um, by time by group um, as, as our um, as, as part of those models. For our secondary outcomes, we use general estimated equations over all time points for responder analysis and perceived improvement and linear um, mixed effects models for patient satisfaction. Our, our study results were, um, over, we, we assessed 806 um, individuals for um, eligibility and allocated um, 750 uh, of those. We again, 750 allocated to usual medical care and 750 allocated to usual medical care plus chiropractic. You can see that the vast majority attended at least one um, visit with, um, with a usual medical provider and, um, and those in the chiropractic group, um, an even larger percent attended at least one visit with a, a doctor of chiropractic. Um, we, we had um, very good, um, compliance with our, our assessments at, at, all, um, at all of our time periods ranging from 85 to 90 percent and and all of our um, all of our we did an intention to treat analysis and it included all 375 um, um, of, of our um, participants in each group in our primary outcomes analysis. So, um, Looking at low back pain intensity, this can give you a, a sense of, um, of what we found in, in each of the groups. We, we, we really focused on, we, we, we powered each site independently because for, for the reasons that, that you saw when I, when I mentioned the, the sites that there were varying numbers of, the, you know, range from one to two chiropractors at, at, at the various sites, um, the sites um, were, had the chiropractic had been incorporated for differing um, amounts of time and and chiropractic was included in in different um with within different um departments and so we wanted to wanted to really um, look at what was happening and there there were other there were other differences as as well that i don't don't have time to go into between sites, such as, as um, average age, for instance, people were tended to be younger in Pensacola and a little bit older in, in Bethesda because, because of, the, of the active duty um, military who, who, are, who tend to be at those MTFs. But what you can see here is that for low back pain intensity at, at all sites, that there, there was a consistent pattern of a, a larger decrease in in pain intensity over time um, in all groups, but but it was it was largest in those who were um, also seeking chiropractic care. We saw a very um, similar pattern with um, low back pain related disability as as well. We um, we with, regarding our responder analysis, you you can see that um, our primary um, endpoint was at what's at six weeks, and you can see that again this is um, indicating those who um, who um, were thirty percent experienced a thirty percent improvement or greater, and you can see that in. Um, on, on, at um, Walter Reed, those receiving um, usual medical care, thirty eight percent. Got 30% um, better or greater compared to 49% receiving chiropractic care at um, in Pensacola. Um, it was 46.1% um, versus 69%, and then at um, in San Diego it was 19.7% um, versus 56%. Um, and that for um, 
that was um, pain intensity, and we see a, a similar, though not quite as striking, pattern um, for um, for disability. And this um, this last graph I wanted to share with you is um, is looking at perception of improvement since baseline. So we basically asked on a, a Likert scale from completely gone to to much worse, how much how how the patient thought they were doing compared to when they they started in the study, and you can see that the majority of people that received um, usual care only reported that they were about the same while those that received chiropractic care the majority reported that they were they were much better so um, overall we concluded that um, this um, that changes in patient reported pain intensity and disability as well as satisfaction with care and low risk of harms favoring um, usual medical care plus chiropractic care were found in this pragmatic clinical trial is um, our findings were, even though we were looking at a, um, a military population, our findings were consistent with the existing literature on spinal manipulation in both military and civilian um, populations. And the magnitude of the mean between group differences for both, um, both pain and disability were consistent with a, a moderate magnitude of effect as classified by the American College of Physicians and American Pain Society guidelines. This um, this article is um, available um, at open access at, at um, JAMA Network Open. We've had um, more than eighty four thousand views since it was um, since it was published. It was one of the the top five articles accessed in in JAMA Network Open's um, first year of, of um, in two thousand eighteen two thousand nineteen. And you can, um, if you're interested, you can find it at um, www.jamanetworkopen.org. So, so as we're as the we're starting to look at the evidence base that 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 supports the the use of chiropractic and greater integration of chiropractic into multidisciplinary um, care teams. Uh, one, one of the things that, that we started to think about, um, myself and my, my colleagues while I was at Palmer, is, is what, what does optimal, optimized chiropractic care look like? And, and what, are, what are the components of that? And how do we, um, and, and what do, as well as what do referral patterns look like? How do, how do we coordinate care between, between primary care physicians primarily and doctors of chiropractic? And so we, we had an opportunity to work on a, a couple of, um, of initiatives. This, um, this first one that I wanna talk about is um, a chiropractic integrated care pathway for low back pain in veterans, um, results of a Delphi um, consensus process. And, and what we did here is we, we looked, we, we talked to, um, we included a, a number of doctors of chiropractic, primary care um, providers and mental health professionals who managed, um, Veterans with low back pain, um, with an emphasis on those that had um, that had mental health comorbidities within veterans' um, healthcare facilities, and what we developed is a, is a series of um, clinical care um, pathways. Um, I'm showing you the example here of um, once in a, a, a trial of chiropractic care is initiated, but we also developed algorithms for how. Um, how that that decision would be made about whether a person should in fact have a have a trial of, of chiropractic care or or not but to, to really bring one of the um, again one of the the criticisms that I hear often about chiropractic has to do with um, concerns about the quality and consistency of chiropractic care and really you know coming together in, is as, as members of multidisciplinary teams to try to figure out what those clinical care pathways should should look like and then and then actually studying those those pathways is 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 a way to help answer some of those questions we also had an opportunity to um in a in a in a subsequent study we had the opportunity to do um further development and and really to here to to move from this this broader sense of a clinical care pathway to um to a, a clinical decision aid for chiropractic management of common conditions causing low back pain in in veterans again we used a uh, a modified Delphi um, consensus process, but in this case, really focusing on on doctors of chiropractic 
who are practicing um, in, in the, the, the VA. And this just gives you a sense of, um, of a, the stepped um, approach that, that, we, um, that we ended up with, with where, we're, where the doctor of chiropractic is identifying the likely um, pain source and contraindications and potential interventions based on, on specific diagnoses. And then, and then um, you know, um, um, biomechanical or physiological diagnoses, and then really considering some of the biopsychosocial factors that, that may influence um, patient response to care. And then finally, um, based on all of these factors together, deciding, helping to figure, trying to decide, uh, using all of these factors to, to then, then focus chiropractic treatment, a, a um, real, really a, a very patient-centered um, specific treatment um, regimen for, for these specific patient conditions. So, so I, I mentioned earlier that that how important it is to I mean it's important to develop these models, but also to test these models and um, clinical care pathways. And um, I, I, the last study that I, that I'd like to talk about is is one that that we are are currently is in in progress. Um, Dr. Um, Cynthia Long at um, Palmer College and I are the co PIs of of this study. We call it Verdict. It's a Chiropractic Care for Veterans, a pragmatic randomized um, trial addressing dose effects for chronic low back pain. This, this study is part of a, of a larger collaboratory that includes um, um, 12 research projects and a, a coordinating center at, at Yale, and, and it, it spans across both. Um, it, it's a collaboration between the VA, DOD, and the National Institutes of Health, um, led by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Health, but um, there are many other um, NIH institutes who are involved as well, and they committed $81 um, million dollars over six years to look at um, look at pain management for um, for both veterans and um, enlisted military personnel. So uh, this um, pragmatic randomized clinical trial. This is a, a precis diagram. It gives you some idea of, of the extent um, to which this meets um, different. Um, Different criteria for pragmaticness. So, so if this was a completely pragmatic trial, that blue, that bluish purple that you see in the center would be would be a circle. But, you know, as with any clinical trial, it's always a mix. You're always trying to balance from being, you know, completely pragmatic and not intervening in any way, and and making sure that the study is rigorous enough to um to to give us a meaningful answer to our question and to and for us to be able to describe it in enough detail so that our findings could actually be replicated. And so you can see that we, um, we are most pragmatic when it comes to outcomes that matter to patients, that our analysis, which will, will include all data, um, we're um, a little bit um, less pragmatic, but still fairly pragmatic in regarding measures to make sure patients adhere to the intervention. Um, the setting is, is completely pragmatic, but it gives you, this just gives you an idea of some of the, the issues that, that, we're, that we're, we have thought about in, in putting together this trial and, and that, we, that we face as we move forward with, um, with recruitment. This gives you an idea of our um, study um, study flow. We will be um, randomly allocating 766 veterans to either a lot low dose of, of um, chiropractic care, which is between one and five visits or a higher dose, um, which is between eight and 12 visits over a 10 week period of time with our primary endpoint at, at week 10. And then we will be um, randomizing people, those who agree to do so, we'll be randomizing people once again to either receive um, long-term care, what's sometimes referred to as maintenance care, but which we call um, chiropractic chronic pain management in this study to, um, to receive either basically one, one visit scheduled um, per month with, with the doctor of chiropractic or, or not. 
um, our patient population, our veteran, 766 veterans who are 18 years or older with self-reported chronic low back pain. Our primary outcome is the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. We have a whole host of secondary outcomes, and actually there, there are probably a, a couple more on this, um, on this list that have been added to this list since I, I put it together. We're also looking at health services, including prescription referrals, clinic visits, and hospitalizations, as well as including a qualitative component that will look at nonspecific treatment effect, factors, intervention effectiveness, and dosage impact. This, um, in this study, it, they say that it, it takes a village to raise a child. It, it takes a small city to, to conduct some of these, these pragmatic clinical trials. And it gives you an idea of, um, of um, our partners for this particular study, which includes um, the Palmer Center for Chiropractic Research, which is the institution of record, Dartmouth, the University of Iowa, Yale, um, and then VA centers in Connecticut, Iowa City, uh, Minneapolis, and um, Los Angeles. So, um, so in in conclusion, you know, my conclusion is always going to be more more research is is needed. But uh, I, I had the opportunity to attend a. Um, a, a um, multidisciplinary meeting at the National Academies about um, about a year and a half ago, and and the purpose of of the meeting was really to look at it to try to identify you know what where are the research gaps for when it comes to complementary and integrative medicine, and and certainly we were able to identify. Um, Many gaps, but but one of the overwhelming um, overwhelming messages that came from that um, from that meeting was you know the number of people you know scientists that and policymakers that that said you know we we definitely need to con continue to focus on on more research, but in the meantime we really need to focus on implementation and 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 how do we actually work on implementing the the research that that is already known and and i think that that's that's something that i'm working on currently now at duke is is looking at how can we how can we implement um non-operative spine care um at the at the forefront of the patient experience um in a, in a more deep way than 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 we are currently but also to start looking at, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm thinking about, you know, we definitely need to move towards implementation, but I think it's important to do that in the context of a continuous learning laboratory and making sure that we are, are, are in fact collecting data with the, uh, as, we, as we engage in these implementation efforts. And some of the, some of the questions that I think we are really important to focus on in the, on the future are, Comparing, comparing the determining the comparative effectiveness of integrating non-pharmacological models of care versus usual care again in in real world settings and then and then looking at um, co estimating and comparing medical resource use and costs of implementing um, non-pharmacological approaches to usual care we're, we're starting to gather some preliminary data on costs but there's so much more that that we need to know and 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 we need to be gathering that data in in the context of, of large pragmatic clinical trials i i think in addition to continuing to look at large database analysis and then finally looking at um at, at what what is the impact of, of of various implementation strategies that are focused both on on physician training, on patient education and tools, and then and then the combination of, of both. And so these are these are the 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 research paths of 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 the future. I always, I always think about you know in some ways I could, I could have um, called this talk the ghosts of research past, present, and and future because you're always you know so you're writing up the paper from the study that that you that you finished and and working at data collection for for the or or trying to implement the study that that's currently ongoing and then thinking about the the next study and. And these are real, again the the areas that I think is going to be really important to to focus on in the future. I had an opportunity to as a as a member of NCCIH's National Advisory um, Committee several years ago. I had an opportunity to listen to um, Francis Collins give a talk to the council, and 
the the quote that the, the the thing that he said said that really stuck in my mind during that talk was when it comes to back pain we have kind of done everything wrong and yeah i think he meant you know from a societal perspective we've kind of done everything wrong and and i think we have an opportunity now to really step back and 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 think about what does it mean to do everything right and what can each of us contribute to that effort you know whether it's you know being the very best you know chiropractic clinician evidence based chiropractic clinician that you can be whether it's you know um, um, medical physicians as part of multidisciplinary teams that that include other um, that that are open to the use of non-pharmacological therapies consistent with the recommendations of the American College of Physicians, and then the scientists making sure that we're asking the right questions, that we're they're answering them in a in a rigorous way, and then finally um, our our policymakers that they're they're and our, our including our health systems looking that we're looking at the data and figuring out uh, ways to implement that data and, or use that data to um, to drive implementation of evidence-based guideline concordant care. So with that, I'd like to um, thank you so much for your attention this morning and happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you, Christine. Um, as expected, that was a remarkable talk. So much rich information <clears throat> coming from so many different kinds of, of of uh, data sources and also just the social culture of integrating um, this uh, modality into academic medicine in a new level and in a new way. Um, so some of our questions are very specific uh, to some of your studies and some are more general. So I'm going to start with some simpler ones that I'm sort of gleaning uh, and then move into some of the others. Uh, one question was in the JAMA network study and maybe in some of the others, to what extent um, did you limit the types of modalities and the types of therapies that the chiropractor doctors um, delivered? Obviously, you know, chiropractic is multimodal, as you said. Um, were there constraints? Um, and if, um, if there was a, a package, how was that monitored in terms of fidelity? And then with that, at the very end of that is, um, given the multimodal nature of these practices and how we shape them within a clinical trial, how generalizable are these results to the broader chiropractic community? No, th those are all really, really excellent questions. And, and obviously something that, that you have to think about a lot when, you, when you're designing pragmatic trials for um, the kind of multimodal care that, that is common in, in chiropractic practice. And so what, what we did with the, um, the study in JAMA Network Open, we called it ACT, we, we did not, we, we chose chiropractors, we chose locations where the chiropractors um, practiced in, in somewhat a, a similar manner. I mean, it wasn't uniform. In Pensacola, they, there was a lot more focus on, on exercise instruction, for example, but, but basically they, they all used, um, diversified manipulation um, and flexion distraction, which are the two most common um, um, forms of spinal manipulation and the, the ones with the, the, the highest level by far of, of scientific evidence. So, so we knew that, th that that was going to be their, their focus as far as spinal manipulation goes. We did not, we did not specify what they, what they could or could not do, but we, we did we did track it, and so we were able to describe in, in the paper a, a summary of the, the types of therapies that that the patients um, that the patients received. But at the end of that study, we we also felt like we did not have that that information as um, that information was not as specific as we would like it to be. And so for the verdict study that that were um, that is just beginning. We we made we created a specific template um, within the EHR that tracks a lot more detail about the the different treatments that are that are being used. In it, in addition, we 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 created the the clinical care pathways that that I mentioned and are are sharing that with the. The, with the doctors of chiropractic who are involved in that that VA study, so they're they're aware so of um, of that information, and so so again trying to 
trying to make sure that we're pragmatic, but getting us making sure we have a, an understanding of the types of treatment that the patients are receiving. As, as far as generalizability, I, I feel that that um, the that the ACT study is is fairly generalizable to for to the majority of, of chiropractic practice because if you look at the the national um the national um board of um the national board of chiropractic um education um they nbce they they conduct a survey every five years and look at what kinds of treatments what are the most common treatments that doctors of chiropractic are using and there's there's um there's some there, there's a fair amount of synergy between that that list and and what we found in um in the in the act study now but now it's not generalizable to all chiropractic i want to be really clear about about that and chiropractors who are using other techniques with less evidence um behind them you know may or may not have different results thank you so um, I'm going to shift to one of the more um, conceptual uh, challenges, and I think you, you've addressed this a little bit, but a number of our uh, participants are curious, given the evidence that you showed and the ACP guidelines, um, why do you think um, chiropractic care is not more widely accepted um, and more fully integrated into academic medicine models and interprofessional care. And as you know, we have a conference coming up in November on mm -hmm. um, interprofessional uh, education and, um, and the, the importance of that for changing culture. So I'm curious what you think specifically about um, the integration of chiropractic care. Well, I, I could give an entire lecture, <laughs> you know, on that, that very topic, it's, it's, it's um, so I think there are a number of reasons, and 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 my I think there are three. The the first is that people just simply don't think of chiropractic care. You know, payers and purchasers and um, and and other policymakers when when they're trying to when they're thinking of the solution to the opioid crisis or they're trying to figure out how to best manage low back pain. Um, chiropractic care because we're we're not part of um, you know conventional educational institutions. A lot of people haven't had a lot of experience with chiropractic. They just simply don't think of it. Um, I, I think that um, there are also a fair number of of people that have um, have some bias against chiropractic for maybe because of a personal experience or because of of their training. And then finally, and I, I, I think um, also far more common than, than the biases that there are legitimate questions regarding the, the quality and consistency of chiropractic care delivery, which is why it's, it's so, why these guidelines are, are so important. It's why the American Chiropractic Association two or three years ago participated in the Choosing Wisely initiative and identified five um, low value services that that should be um that, that doctors of chiropractic and patients should be aware of so i think there's a growing um recognition of that and and the, the types of um the types of decision aids and evidence-based exams that that the folks at palmer have been working on for for many years are all are all targeted towards addressing those um, those those real concerns about quality and consistency and I, I think part of it too, Peter, is just what I talked about earlier about exposure to um, to other disciplines. And I've had an opportunity to go in and and um, talk to primary care docs, for instance, who are are now working with doctors of chiropractic because they've been brought together as part of multidisciplinary teams. They've never had that interaction before, and 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 hearing you know just uniformly that there are that their perception of chiropractic changed in significant ways for, with that experience. Though I will say that they don't necessarily generalize that experience. There, there's, a, there's a subset of them that feels like, feel like they have the one good chiropractor and that, that's out there, but, but overwhelmingly they, they feel positive about <clears throat> making referrals and working with them. And, and I, I think that is just you know, getting to know each other better, really. Yeah, and I think that's certainly been our case here at the Osher Center, where we have nice collaborations with neurology and physical therapy and physiatry, and um, that exchange, both in terms of sharing patients, but also 
uh, collaborating on research has, has gone a long way to uh, bringing our uh, understanding of, of where this can fit in in a larger multimodal approach um, much further along. So I have so many other questions here, but we're, we're, we're short on time. And I know that um, many people have to move on. Um, so I wish, um, I hope we can bring you back and continue these discussions. Um, and I wanna thank you um, uh, sincerely for, for taking time to do this and, um, and for sharing all this important information with our community. I have um, a couple of announcements to wrap things up, but I, I know if we were in a place where you can see everyone's expression and, and hear their applause, there's a lot of gratitude. So on behalf of everyone, I wanna thank you and, and applaud your effort today. Um, well, thank you so much, Peter, for the invitation. And, and if people do have questions, um, please feel free to reach out at you know, christine.gertz at duke.edu, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Super. And thanks again for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Great. So just a couple concluding um, comments and announcements. Um, as you know, we do this Grand Rounds every month, and next month we have another um, excellent speaker, one of our colleagues from the Northwestern University's Osher Center, Dr. Melinda Ring there um, is gonna be talking about culinary medicine and the science of the teaching kitchen. And some really interesting programs that she's developed and the research around that. And then the following month on October 6th, Ruth Wolver from Vanderbilt University is gonna be talking about health coaching and how it's used in the training of medical students at Vanderbilt. And then finally, I wanna remind everybody that our uh, November 6th Integrative Medicine Forum um, is, is moving along and registration is open for that. Um, it's an incredibly exciting panel, including um, one third of it devoted to interprofessional education. And we'll have some um, uh, leaders and scholars from the field of, of chiropractic care talking about the history of the integration of chiropractic into um, academic medicine. Um, so be on the lookout as well for calls for research um, and education related uh, abstracts and posters. We're hoping to send that invitation out um, early next week. So uh, we hope you'll consider submitting an abstract for that event, November 6th. So thank you all again for joining in today. Uh, stay safe, stay in touch, and please let your colleagues and friends know about this program. And thank you again, Dr. Gertz.